and welcome to our Oscar special. Uh, we've got Josh Ron with us here. That's perfect as well. And Van Conner have joined us in the studio this morning. Guys, welcome. Good morning. Hello, good, good morning. morning to all. Thank you for being with us. Really appreciate it. We have some news. Uh, so while we were chatting to Connor there, we have some of our first winners of the night at the Oscars 2020, Josh. Yes, the actor in a supporting role goes to Brad Pitt for his role in Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, Hair Love has won the Animated Short Film Award and Animated Feature Film. Bex and I were disappointed that we got it wrong here. We both predicted Klaus, but the Animated Feature Film Award has gone to Toy Story 4, which I think we could be happy about. Yeah, 100%. But actually, I think we, I was probably just following the trends of award season so thinking was that I. Klaus was so going to win. I. But I loved Toy Story 4, 4. I thought it was a really fitting end to the franchise. And actually, you know... It might not be the end. Well, it might... Oh, spoiler alert. It might not be the end. <laughs> Tom, Tom Hanks told me that, you know, the franchise has potential. Uh, Pixar kind of decide on the spot whether they're going to do one near whether they're going to do uh, make another movie yeah. or not I suppose, they I suppose there's some yet. sort of how, it, how, how commercially successful it is as well I suppose mm. gets played into that there's a couple of firsts here as well isn't there so uh, that is the first sequel yes uh, to win of a sequel, is that yeah. right? So, yeah. Yeah, Toy Story 2 or 3? Three. Three. Toy Story 3 won was the Oscar. The that was the first sequel to win in that category, to but this fair, is the first sequel sequel. All of, the, sequel, all of sequel. the Toy Story should have won. I think we probably lost out in the year of Frozen or something like that. Yeah, we have. Yeah. <laughs> and then this is also Brad Pitt's first Oscar. Yeah, yeah. Which is, but isn't, Van, that's remarkable when you think about it. Well, it is, but like you were saying, I mean, well, you look back at his body, well, which one would you have given an Oscar for? Yeah. I mean, the only one that leaps out that you think, okay, that seems like the kind of thing you get an Oscar for is probably Moneyball. And Moneyball's not really what you call a fan favourite. Yeah, yeah. I'm always going to jump in there with Legends of the Fall. It's an instant <laughs> <laughs> All about interview with the vampire, honey <laughs> it's, it's a bit, it's a bit like uh, a bit like Leo, isn't it? As well, mm -hmm. Leonardo DiCaprio waiting all that time, I mean, movie after movie, nomination yeah. after nomination, before he managed to get uh, get get his best actor. And actually, ironically, we were just saying mm. outside of the studio that we've completely omitted the fact that he's also nominated for best at leading role here, and yeah. we're just not considering him as a no. frontrunner for that for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as well. Oh, Leo, it, yeah, yeah of and it's just yeah. kind of, a, is it Brad's pit, pit uh, Brad Pitt's time as opposed? to the credibility of his actual role in this film because with The Revenant it was Leo's time so yeah. now you know are we seeing it so soon after that to see I, him pick up another one I think he won for the wrong role I think he should have won for uh, his role in uh, The Wolf of Wall Street, personally. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think loads of, I think loads I of other people do agree with me on that one. Yeah. And, and then he he won for his role in The Revenant as a kind of award for yes, the Academy and Hollywood appreciates all the work you've done. This is your yeah, award for yeah. all the this awards. Is, this, that this is your year. Kind of yeah. Thing. Uh, our producer John is also a filmmaker, our film critic. John. Yes. Um, can I say Brad Pitt has actually already won an Oscar? Oh. Go on. Just not in the acting category. He was one of the producers of 12 Years of a Slave. Of course he was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he is already an Oscar winner, but this is his first time <sighs> in the and, um, and, and what, did he, because he, he wasn't uh, literally named, though, was he? Well, it yes. wasn't an individual award, yes. was it? No, he was one of the producers on that film. And that film won. Yeah. It's yeah. like an ensemble award, really. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's that Brad's award. <laughs> it's his but first he's personal also, Oscar. He's also been in, he's also acted in many films that have won uh, Oscars as well, right? So can he have that attributed to him no. as well? No. But <laughs> but the, 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 the Best Picture Award goes to the producers, and there's a limited number of producers who can be listed on, uh, or, or any nominees that can be listed on any award. Right. But he was one of the five that picked up. Yeah. He was one of the five producers of that film. Okay. Oh God, I can, I can sense the tone of the night from John. <laughs> He's going to be very picky. Uh, <laughs> very concerning, isn't he? It's already begun. Um, uh, really interestingly, in the uh, in the uh, category of short animation, is it animated short? Yeah. Yeah. Animated short thing? film. So this is this is interesting because this plays into the conversation, the sort of wider conversation that is going on already. Uh, we've got a text from John saying, my biggest bugbear about awards shows is that you can guarantee at some point there are, there's going to be comments about uh, how there isn't enough diversity in the nominee or winners uh, and how the awards in the si uh, society isn't diverse enough. Uh, yeah, there is, because it isn't, is it? So, yeah, of course it is. Um, and, and Bex would say an interesting one here, because this film in particular um, is very much in that category of being yeah, diverse. Yeah, absolutely, it? and it's great to see that so early on in the awards because what we have been missing in may, all the major categories starting off i'm going to start off with this as a big bugbear here the directing category no females are, di uh, are nominated there greta gerwig is a big name that isn't nominated there but across the board we're missing people like 
Okafina, who won for the Golden Globes for um, the farewell. The farewell, yep. And also we're seeing a lack of J Lo as well. <laughs> I don't think any of us ever thought we'd yeah. say, but well deserved credit where credit's due. In Hustlers, she was amazing. Was How, weird is it, though? How weird is it, though, that we now live in a time in which people are actually annoyed that Adam Sandler doesn't have an awards nomination and <laughs> J-Lo doesn't have one. Like, the 90s are truly up. Yeah, really exactly. Are. And there was a really stunning uh, stat that I saw the other day. Um, so this is, this is of 732 awards over the course of 90 years of the Oscars, 732 awards of those given to ethnic minorities. Jeez. Wow. 37. Wow. wow. That's incredible. And actually, 37. another stat for you, back to the directing uh, nominees. There have only ever in the entire awards history been five female directors nominated mm. and only one has ever won, which is Catherine Bigelow for The Hurt Locker. Actually, can we just go back, go back to Brad Pitt a second? Because yeah. there's just weird things that you notice about, like, like you say, about number of female directors. Things. Mm. Weird thing, at 56 years old, Brad Pitt, youngest person in the best sport in that category. Wow. Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he's in great so company that, here. Tom, oh, yeah. Tom Hanks, uh, Al Pacino, Joe Pesci. <laughs> Joe Pesci, wow. I mean, if you're ever going to lose, it's nice to lose <laughs> against that one. Right? And also <laughs> Anthony Hopkins for the two papers as well. Yeah, Anthony Hopkins is, uh, is a legend in, in, as well as he. Um, okay, listen, we, we've got lots more to digest. We're going to do some more in a little bit. Uh, Mark Donaldson's going to bring us up to date with the sport as well in a sec. <laughs> Almost half past two, Monday morning, uh, on Talk Radio. I'm Daryl Morris. Our Oscars special, uh, well and truly on. Josh Rom, our arts and entertainment correspondent, is here. Film critics, uh, Rebecca Perfect and Van Connor join us as well. Uh, guys, how are we? And we're an hour and a half into the ceremony now. It's very predictable. Is it really? Is that where we're at? <laughs> yeah. Very predictable? Yeah. Uh, we've had some more awards. We've had, let's, let's get, uh, get into one of the big ones. We've had uh, actress in a supporting role. Is that right? In the last yep. 10 minutes or so? That is Laura Dern for Marriage Story. I mean, she was up against, you know, there's some greats in here. We've got uh, Kathy Bates. She was up against her for Richard Jewell. Scarlett Johansson for Jojo Rabbit. Florence Pugh for Little Women. And Margot Robbie for Bombshell. But Laura Dern has won across the board throughout the whole of award season. So she was always the front run runner. And that's why I'm it's predictable. We weren't expecting anyone else to win. Van, what, why? What's setting her apart then from the other, other people in that category? I think because, to be honest, this, this seems to be the one category that Marriage Story can can double down on in terms of, in terms of having an anchor point. It wasn't. It, it's not a film that I think is going to resonate well in any other category, really. Uh, if it wasn't going to get anything for writing, then it had to be this. And to be fair, the, the writing category was so strong this year. Um, I, I still argue, I mean, as much as I love Parasite, I still find it weird that that one best original screenplay. But uh, for, for, for performance, I really thought it was either going to go to this or a surprise win for Florence Pugh. Yeah, I, I'd put Florence Pugh, uh, Pugh down actually. To mm. be honest with you, I thought um, I thought Little Women. I mean, again, again, you know, that that let's give some awards to Little Women kind of vibe. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, there is that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know what? It's another. It's, it's it's a win for Netflix. You know, with Marriage Story. So that's the thing. It's you know, Netflix twenty nominations across the board. It's moving in the right direction in terms of you know showing the progression of how people are watching content now days and the Academy is at least, you know, acknowledging that with all of those nominations. So we couldn't see Marriage Story kind of picking up all the big awards necessarily. It's kind of like a little bit, it feels like an indie hit in a way, doesn't it? It yeah. does still, doesn't it? But there is also that, that, that tenuous connection as well with Little Women in that, you know, Marriage Story, Noah Baumbach, uh, writing, directing, uh, Little Women, Greta Gerwig, writing, directing, and of course they're, uh, you know, a couple in real life. And there's a lot of overlap in their work and their sensibilities and their style. I yeah. would say that uh, it does at times feel like she makes sort of feminist Noah Baumbach movies and it feels like he makes, you know, masculine Greta Gerwig movies. So <laughs> right. there's a lot of overlap in that sort of sense there. That's interesting. Definitely a, a fitting couple. Um, uh, Laura Dunn apparently also thanked Netflix in her uh, acceptance speech. Yeah. Um, ne Netflix also have uh, the Irishman in the game as well, don't they? Um, how much are they? Um, how much are they going to be, be, be banking on that? Because it's actually, it's actually not. Uh, got any awards yet, and, and it, it potentially might be overlooked for quite a few here. The thing with The Irishman was that the, the process of, uh, of greenlighting and putting into production The Irishman came about at that exact point, was it two or three years ago, when Netflix went against Cannes. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah, went yeah, up yeah, against yeah, Cannes yeah. about the, the, the strenuous rules uh, because they weren't, weren't releasing their films in cinemas, for instance, and there was, there was the refusal to screen them at the Cannes film festivals and other festivals were, were threatened to follow suit because, of course, where Cannes goes, everywhere else follows. And, uh, you yeah, know, it was around that time that Netflix sort of announced that they were going to give Martin Scorsese 190 million to make a near four hour mobster movie with, you know, the Avengers of mobster actors. <laughs> right, right. You know, the Avengers roster of, you know, the old time gangster actors. Right. And it just became a thing, but well, this has to get resolved.
solved in the next two years because there's not a chance that Netflix release The Irishman and it gets ignored. And obviously, that came about a little bit quicker than, than we'd, we'd, ha we'd expected because Roma, you know, we had all that last year. Mm. And that obviously, that was kind of the big, we need to get this sort of pre-Irishman. Luckily, they did it in time for another film to pull a similar trick. So they are banking a lot. I mean, you wouldn't give that amount of money to Martin Scorsese for any other reason than this guy's bringing us a statue home. Yeah. It is interesting, though, because I'm not really sure where the Irishman's really going to pick up all the awards mm, because yeah. it's got 10 nominations. Major acting omission is Robert De Niro from uh, lead actor, but um, in the supporting roles, we've got both Al Pacino and Joe Pesci, but uh, across the board again. It's not yeah. really, it, isn't, it isn't, is it? I think if we're honest no. about it, it's probably not, is it? Is there, is there a, a possibility, that, Josh, that they might they might give it a token win somewhere along, along the line? I actually don't think so. What's very interesting about The Irishman is that Netflix is renowned for not announcing their figures, but they were very quick to announced that The Irishman was watched by 26 million accounts in its first seven days of streaming. So that's kind of a sense of them trying to put The Irishman into the forefront of the film industry. I mean... Where, where, where does 26 million kind of rate on the, on the scale, film-wise? Well, if we, if we think about it, if 26 million accounts watch and they are paying $10 for a subscription fee per month, then technically they have kind of made, in terms of a profit, $109 million thereabouts in that film. So I think that's why they were, they were very quick to announce well, it by saying for, it's quite big. You're, you're also paying for all, all sorts of other programming as well, though, aren't you, in, in amongst that fee? So it's, it's not so. Uh, what about 1917? How did that do, kind of money and figures wise? Do we oh, know? I, mean, yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. I do, I do. I've got all the figures here. So their budget was 90 to $100 million. Um, and in the box office, they have taken. Uh, over $250 million. So they've got an at least $150 million profit there. And do we know how many how many people watched it? Do we have do we have those kind of figures? Or do we just no, have, no, no, we just no. It's, it's only because Netflix have that internal data where they yeah. know how many people watched it. When it comes to uh, people going to the cinema, I don't think we can make can't, estimates. They can't, did you see how many tickets were about, sold? I'd imagine that it's far less. Like, how many people are really going to the cinemas nowadays? It's an expensive, you know, pastime to do, which is a shame. The thing is, is that when when Netflix released The Irishman, it's in the thick of awards season. So November time it came mm. out. They're peacocking, you know? They're going, hey, guys, you know, it's all a marketing thing at the end of the day. How much push have you got behind a film to get it noticed, to get it recognised for those big awards? And I'm not surprised in the slightest that they start putting out those viewing figures because they're saying, hey, we're here, we want to play with the big boys, and we want to say and it's a clever way of doing it and they didn't do it for marriage story they did it purely for the irishman they haven't announced their figures for marriage story which is a very interesting ploy because that's kind of favoring one picture over the other because marriage story picked up quite a few nominations throughout award season as well and i think the thing is last year it was very much netflix banking on roma this time they've gone in with two options they've gone in hard on those two options bearing in mind it's clear that they favored the irishman even though it looks like marriage stories actually going to come up more on top than They've marriage actually got three year. options in there. They've got the two popes as well, which mm. um, yes. picked up some acting categories. What's that? What, what's, what's, I mean, obviously, apart from just making good films and, and, and having people watch them, what, with, with The Irishman, what's, what is their end game there then? I mean, you say about taking on the, the, the studios. Um, is that about getting more original scripts to them, more directors to come and work with them? There is that. I mean, Netflix is structured in such a way that uh, it, it, it's a house of cards. There's lo and the cards on the lower ranks are made up of of your cheap and cheerful rom-coms, your To All the Boys I Loved Before, your billion and one cheap and cheerful Hallmark-style Christmas movies that they uh, they upload every uh, late October <laughs> yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. And the success of those is what allows them to fund the heavy hitters like they do. You, it takes a lot to, you know, it takes a lot to allow you to give Michael Bay $200 million to go and make <laughs> a Ryan Reynolds actioner, which, you know, I will just say I enjoyed more than most people. I'm so saddened to see it didn't make the awards, obviously. But, uh, you know, you don't get to, you don't get to make that level level of excess, that level of, you know, big boy rivalry. And that's that's what The Irishman and, and Six Underground, less, uh, less extent Marriage Story. Marriage Story is a movie that has been precision crafted for uh, the Independent Spirit Awards, yeah. those kind of, that yeah. kind of level of awards. But it's exceeded it's in that respect, did, yeah. Yes, and I, I have to say, I have to kind of a love-hate relationship with Netflix, because what Netflix is doing is pulling us away from the traditional cinema-going mm. uh, experience. But what it's also doing is opening up a larger audience to films that you wouldn't traditionally go and see. So 
Roma is a great example yeah. of that. You know, Marriage Story as well, those more independent films mm. or those more art house films, which because of the hype around it, people are going, well, I need to go and check that out. In fact, I can do that from the comfort of my own, yeah. of my own home. And I think that's a positive thing for and filmmaking. It, and it has hype because it's the, because Netflix getting involved in a big move like that is a story. That's the what. That's the reason. Yeah, I think because it's it's giving itself some controversy at the same time. So everyone was waiting to see because of Roma what comes next. Yeah. Now we're seeing three big films that are hitting. Not a lot of people would have gone and seen the two popes, yeah. but actually a yeah. lot of people are tuning in to go and watch that and finding out that it's actually a more lovable story than you anticipated it to be. It's something much more watchable than you'd expect. Um, with with the Irishman. I mean, it's a clever tactic. You're bringing together all the greats. You want to see them on screen one last time. The interesting oh, thing I found... Oh, oh, they've got decades left on. in them. They've got years <laughs> left. <laughs> the interesting thing I found with The, the Irishman was mm. it was very strange how many people did not seem to realise that it was a Netflix film. And I think... Because uh, when, when did it screen at the LFA? It was about a month before yeah, it was released. So, yeah, like but it, was, it had a theatrical release It did for have a, a theatrical weeks. release. But yeah. the weirdest thing about that was... I remember I was, I, was, I was on a job one day and I was talking to one of the assistants... And she said, have you seen any good films lately? And I, went, I saw The Irishman, that was very good. She said, oh, I can't wait, I'll have to get the cinema and see that. But I never get the time to get the cinema. I'm like, well, actually, you know, it is going to be on Netflix three weeks later. She said, is it? Right. Oh, that's brilliant, I'll watch it that way then. Right, right, but, right. And that's a counterpoint to the number of people I know who, even after it hit Netflix, genuinely went and sought it out. You know, theatrically went and saw it. I mean, the Prince Charles it was evidently packed out. Every screening it put on, on numerous friends right. who, uh, you know, they took they took their families, and it was it was a weird thing. It just seemed to be very popular, and none of them seemed to realise how long it was either, because that was the yeah. first thing everyone said when they came out. Was, well, well they can't watch it all in one yeah. go. Which mm -hmm. actually, if you yeah. watched it as a cinematic experience, you'd have to sit through yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. But with the power of Netflix, mm. you can pause it, come back to it, and I think you lose a lot of the pizzazz as a result of that. Yeah, and that's, a lot that's, not, that's not a good thing, is it? No, it's, it's not. Because that's why yeah. I think a lot of people think it's like an a bit of a sort of afternoon, Sunday afternoon gangster movie when actually if you, I watched it in the cinema at a screening and I was like, I was taken in by it. I loved it. But I you sort of had no option but to not be distracted by yeah, for three and a half the, the opportunity hours. to turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dear God, give me a break. Um, Eminem's performing right now. I oh, saw this. this yeah, is a bit weird, isn't Band it? Of one, but this is this is obviously because he's an alumni because of uh, Eight Mile and Lose Yourself. Yeah, and apparently there was a bit of a speech about uh, from the Hamilton creator about uh, the importance of music in film and that's, Manuel Miranda. Yeah, yeah he's got into the heights coming up. Um, duh. Okay then. Not not your facts. The importance of music in a film. I mean, yeah, okay, the, yeah, music is important. Do we do we need us? Are we at a point where we need a speech on um, the importance of music in a film? Well, not really, because it is what. Like, I think they should make more of a point on diversity in film, things like that. You know, because we've got what one category for. Well, we've got the original score, but you know, the uh, original song as well. It's two categories that we're seeing across the board again. When there's so many other issues that need to have time dedicated to it. I've we've got Joaquin coming out later. Later on, stay oh, tuned. Yeah. I, I will stay point tuned. out that we, with, given the diversity problem they've got this year, the fact that there is a white rapper performing is almost <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Isn't it? It is. Um, John wanted to come in, so um, we've probably done something wrong. I said something no, wrong. No, but no, do you want to correct us on this time, John? Uh, uh, no, I was just going to say the, the reason why Netflix would have gone for The Irishman is because of Martin Scorsese. They want to make a big statement that we can get this legendary film director to make a film for us. And it's, it's just about making statements. Am I right in thinking that in the run-up to that, Martin Scorsese himself did say that he had tried to get funding elsewhere? He had, and he yeah, yeah. And it was only to Netflix studios, that was And yeah. studios wouldn't give him money. So exactly. Martin Scorsese couldn't get funding in the traditional way, mm. so went to Netflix, and, and Netflix funded it, and, uh, and that's why they've done it. Does that kind of defeat Martin Scorsese's point, then? Because it might... Uh, sorry, does that def uh, defeat Netflix's point? Because if Netflix are uh, uh, wanting to show that they can get this big director, but it comes as a result of him not being able to get funding anywhere else. This is the thing, is the idea that, you know... It, it, even this great director cannot utilize the traditional system because the traditional system is so outdated now and so dependent on newer, more gimmicky concepts, superhero movies, etc., that uh, utilizing something like Netflix, who have the resources and are willing to take more gambles, that works out more in his favor. And you might also end up seeing Netflix kind of being that, that helpful hand in terms of getting more mm. diverse content on your screens because... If if Martin Scorsese cannot get funding, yeah, how exactly. can you know the the, the smaller um, you know studios that are wanting to turn out like more independent content? How are they ever going to be able to do that? And how is, therefore how are we going to tackle that issue? Is that is that a bit of an argument though to say that actually Hollywood is, Hollywood Hollywood is more of a meritocracy than we think it is? In the in the yeah absolutely one, yeah. A, a very a very mm -hmm. a very uh, renowned white director can't get funding yeah. because his film wasn't good enough. It was too long. Yeah, it was too clunky. 
Because you know, you know, all the things that, that people are sort of uh, have called out for being, all of those reasons. Yeah. So, you know, if people if people from if he can't diverse, do it, who can? Yeah. Well, yeah. If people from diverse backgrounds aren't getting uh, films commissioned, it's because they're not good enough. Well, I mean, it's interesting to me as I, well. By the way, I probably wouldn't necessarily <laughs> argue that or believe that. Because I think that's probably, <laughs> before we swiftly move on, and that gets attributed to me as a fact. <laughs> it is interesting to me that his entire marketing gimmick for the Irishman did seem to be, I tell you what, I'll go before the microphones of the world and slate the only other game in town, which also coincidentally happens to be the most diverse game in town. That one, the irony's not lost on me. Yeah. Uh, we do have some news. another winner? Uh, this is a shock. Sound editing has gone to Ford versus Ferrari. Ooh. I put down 1917. Oh. No, I, 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 I picked that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah. I, I had it and then gave it up for 1970. I did initially think Ford v Ferrari, but then as 1917 seemed to be... Come on, the more running more, of those I engines. She's <laughs> 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 Cobbler's sausage roll. What a movie. How, uh, how, oh, I've got that as well, sound editing. Is that sound editing or sound mixing? Sound, sound editing. editing. Oh, I've got that as well for Ford versus Ferrari. What I would say is so far we are looking at two losses for 1917 in production design and sound editing, some in which the pundits and the narratives did kind of push for with this. So, we you haven't know, seen one win for it yet. Not one that, win for 1917. Um, does that give us any indication as to how it's going to steer when it comes to best picture? Or Do you know what? When, when Bohemian Rhapsody... Uh, uh, one sort of all the big awards, suddenly it was picking up on the technical categories and everyone was like, hang on a sec, we need to kind of take note of this. Uh-oh. I want to take it back. <laughs> 1917 just won the award for ah. sound mixing. Okay. There, we there we go. First win of the night. I also have as well. Can, can I just say, now, one of the little preview things that you can always do with the Oscars is whichever film wins sound mixing quite often goes on to win Best Picture. Because most oh. people who vote in the Oscars have no idea what goes on in sound mixing, so they yep. just pick their favourite film. Ah, That's very true. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's good knowledge. That is very <laughs> good. Choices, though. Some of the things that have won the sound categories over the years have been absolutely bizarre. Really? What, bad films? Just, just, those are just like, I don't think anyone knows what these right? categories mean. <laughs> so they, like Johnny says, they just pick the films they like. But that, that is a big, part, a big part of this. The problem here is mm. that there's hundreds of films yeah. that the judges can't watch them all anyway. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they're judging things they're not necessarily are fair with, and therefore you're left with a bit of a pointless exercise. And you know what? We saw that. Well, we the, Johnny and I, I were talking earlier about the Baftas having that problem. So with the Baftas, the nominations that came out came out for each Bafta member to watch was 269 films that they wow. would need to watch in order to whittle it down to in you each know, individual. Each individual had 260 films. Each individual, yeah, that's the whole kind of spread of films. So that's, Whoa. I think that's 65 days worth of watching movies. How can you possibly do that? I mean, we were arguing whether or not it's actually your responsibility as a BAFTA member to do that. Yeah. But that means when things like Queen and Slim, mm. as a great example, were being missed because people just didn't have the time to watch it or it wasn't one of those kind of big hitter films that they might want to sit down and watch, you're ending up with, you know, losing that, that, that diversity within filmmaking and mm. also what well, you're doing there is is having something that needs to fundamentally be changed as a voting system. Frank, can you make your point in like 10 seconds? Uh, no, I'll get back to it, but okay. it, is, it, is a, it is a long similar line, but it can wait. Okay, right that then, we'll come back to it, uh, because we need to move on, we need to get a break in, and we're going to speak to Terry George, uh, who is another interesting uh, angle, another interesting dimension on tonight's events. He is a seat filler, uh, not literally tonight at the Oscars, but he has done the Oscars before. He was also famously at the Grammys earlier on this year as well. He got mistaken for being part of Billie Eilish's uh, entourage, even Billie Eilish's granddad at one point as well, because he was sat directly behind her for the whole ceremony. Uh, we'll find out why he was there. He's not a part of the music industry, he's not a part of Billie Eilish's uh, crew at all, but he's got an incredible story to tell. He's on talk radio before three this morning. Hang on. We're going to get back to the Oscars. Uh, we've had a couple of awards in since. Uh, Van Connor is here with us, Rebecca Perfect as well, Josh Rom, their take on the ups and downs, ins and outs, winners and losers, next on talk radio. Hang on. 24, good morning, it's Monday on Talk Radio. I'm Daryl Morris, we are doing our Oscars special tonight. It is on, it is happening. We are well and truly underway in uh, Los Angeles for Oscars 2020. Van Connor's with us here as well. Rebecca Perfect and Josh Rom. Hi. Good morning. Howdy. Um, thank you for being with us, everybody. Uh, we've got a couple more uh, awards won in the time that we've been talking about the small screen. Uh, Josh, take us through, please. Bombshell um, has won uh, makeup and hairstyling. That was unsurprising. Uh, the transformation from Charlize there on to uh, Megan Kelly was praised across the board. Uh, Parasite has won international feature film. Uh, that has now won two awards at the Oscars. Our current tally is 1917 Leeds with three, followed by Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Parasite, 
Ford versus Ferrari with two wins each. Okay. Does that now shift the momentum perhaps back to 1917 in terms of leading up to that best picture? Well, awards? I think last well, last time we spoke, we were going, where, what's happening? Yeah. 1917. Yeah. And that's the thing. It can all change because when we go through the technical ca categories, we start seeing what's going to pick up and what's not. And, you know, Ford versus Ferrari is a bit of a surprise when it's been picking Pushing up the, up uh, yeah, you know, yeah, the editing um, nominations there, uh, wins there. And then, yeah, we're now starting to see 1917 emerge. Nothing for Joker yet, which... Oh. Which is incredible, isn't it, really, yeah. when you think about it? Yeah. I, mean, I know that that's the way these things kind of go, but, but still, I mean, that was the blow-away film. But, Along with 1917, perhaps. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing for me, though, as well, is that uh, th there is actually, going back to what you saying about Ford v Ferrari, mm. there are people, there's a small subset of people who do hold to the belief that Ford v Ferrari could be the dark horse film that comes out of nowhere. That's Josh Rawls. I, I told you. Josh I told you. I mean, I personally don't subscribe to that theory. I think if there, is, if there is a film that turns out to be the dark horse and, and comes out and sweeps it, I actually think it would be Joker. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think, realistically, it's, it's you know, a two-thirds 1917, one the Parasite, but uh, we shall see. I mean, if Parasite does take Best Picture, then obviously it becomes a record breaker for winning Best yeah. International Feature and uh, Best Picture. Well, it's already made history, hasn't it, with the Best well, yeah. International Feature. The the first film from South Korea to um, to win that particular yeah. award. So, yeah, <sighs> groundbreaking in its sense. It's also, you know, it's nice to see that it is doing, well, how many have we got, Josh? How many for Parasite? Two. Two, two yeah. so, so it's not like, you know, it's not like yeah. something's running away with all the Oscars Well, I mean, right now. Yeah. the leader at the moment is Three, uh, it's three wins yeah. for uh, once, 1917, one, isn't it? Yeah, like once upon a time in Hollywood is, well, yeah. is also at two. So. The, the conversation that we were having about Joker, though, and I remember uh, John and I discussing this when it first was first released. It was, it was, this is it. This is going to be the runaway success at the Oscars this year. Yeah, unfortunately, it's proved to be a bit divisive. So that's why I think you know some people loved it, some people hated it. Divisive it, in what sense? Well, I think, well, from my point of view, I I loved it, but I know comic book enthusiasts actually <laughs> probably. Probably, Van, you can step in on this one. Didn't love it as much, and you know it's divisive. In that it's divisive in its its content, its its depiction of mental health as well. But it wasn't a comic book movie, though, was it? Right. Okay. First of all, let, let's have this one out. Okay. Bring it on. Right. In the run-up to the release of Joker, Todd Phillips told every single person that would, would listen, which was an annoyingly large number of people, that Joker was not based on any existing work, that it was a wholly original story entirely of his creation. How, then, is it justifiable that that was nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay? If he's saying it's an original screenplay, how does the studio then put it forward as an adapted screenplay? That's a contradiction. Hold on, hold on, Josh. John, did we... Well, because the characters... The, the main character was Joker, and has been from another published source. Star Trek so Discovery is based on characters, based on uh, concepts created by uh, Gene Roddenberry. It's yeah. not an adaptation, then. It's it's a spin-off. It's a wholly original concept which happens. No, but, it's, it's, but the characters are adapted, so it was adapted hmm. from another literary source. Josh. I was going to say, I'm putting my hand up. Uh, right before the movie uh, started, uh, there was DC branding on it. It was branded as a DC movie. Therefore, it is clearly stating, yeah, like, yeah, Todd Phillips may have said, it's my own screenplay. So the, the yeah, fact it was branded a DC movie. But it has to be um, a DC so the character. Point, exactly, point, so point, and that makes it adapted. Okay, so hang on. So the point that, that Todd Phillips is making there is that is not that it isn't a DC movie, not mm. that it isn't adapted. It's not based on any existing work. But it, but it, but it isn't, uh, oh. I've hey, got breaking news. Hang on. I'm, on that note, John, go well, on. Joker's just won his first Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm actually very happy about that news because I think yeah. uh, Hilda Gwynn's Tears uh, score is incredible. It, it's, it's amazing. She oh, won so the Golden Globe for this. Score, and she it? won the BAFTA. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I think she's the first female to win best score at the Oscars as well. It's, it's a beautiful score. Which, yeah. which, true to form for the Joker, has a controversy in itself because Gary Glitter is... <laughs> yes, uh, Gary Glitter's featured during featured. the... It, the it is. Down, one of the most iconic bits of the film. But really. actually, uh, the, the controversy about that was whether Gary Glitter should get money for it. But actually, he doesn't get money for it because he doesn't own the rights to his own material, his own work. So therefore, yes, they used his song, but he doesn't gain anything from it. Okay. Um, nothing for the Irishman yet, still. So we're still, we're still mm. blank on the Irishman? Yeah, I think so, we are. So. Yeah. Are, we, are, we, are we, we're creeping towards it, it coming away completely without an award, are we? Quite possibly. And do you know what? That, again, it's one of those things that it's, it's the hype. Um, 
that, that really does kind of that set the tone originally. But actually, as we talked about, like with people watching it on Netflix, suddenly you're drawn away, and it's a bit like I can't sit through all of this. I'm not saying that this is what the Academy felt, but just general sentiments towards that film, and maybe some Academy voters kind of felt that way as well. Mm. This is the that goes back to the point I was going to make earlier when we, we were running out of time, which yes. was there was a whole there's it's a about two hours ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I nearly forgot the point. That's why. But there's been a whole thing this year about Academy voters and them actually watching the films and the attitudes that some of them have taken to said films. Mm. And in the case of something like The Irishman, for instance, where they've made comments like, I wouldn't watch that, it's too long. Um, where they've made comments mm. about Little Women, oh, it's needlessly convoluted. And also would I for bother? Jennifer Lopez, her, ba her back it's, catalogue has yeah. not been very strong, so why would we consider her exactly. a serious actress now? Right. That's not fair. It should be credit where credit's due. Yeah. And she did an amazing performance. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I, I guess I those attitudes so sort of deep rooted in, in Hollywood and in the Academy yes. that it's, it's yes. we're never yes. going to move away from that. Yeah, yes. yes. That's why Bob Shaw's not for best picture. Right. Yeah. Because God forbid a movie about the suffering of anyone who works for Fox News get any time from anyone who works in the quote unquote Hollywood elite. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, also, Parasite we need to give a mention too because that's made some history, hasn't it, in it the last uh, yeah. couple of hours or so. Uh, what piece of history? The first South Korean uh, film to be nominated for and win an Academy Award. Which is not... Uh, not it's Best International Film. Oh, best International Film. Yes, yes, yes. Which award. isn't a surprise. No. Um, what does that mean in terms of in terms of sort of uh, film in that part of the world? It's quite a big, quite a big moment for them and for the film industry yeah, in that part of the world. Yeah, it's a massive right? moment. But yeah. also what it means in terms of these awards as well, it means that this is where we saw Roma mm. sort, of, sort of pick up this award but not pick up Best Film. And everyone thought that would be the way it would go. So, you know... You know, from, from this perspective, are we going to see history repeat itself again this year yeah. and not see Parasite be the surprise? Not upset, I don't want to use that <laughs> as a word, but, it, you know, lots of people are expecting 1917 yeah. to pick up the big award and maybe Parasite might. I, uh, who knows? This okay. is the exciting bit of it. <laughs> uh, you've got to go, haven't you? But you're going to be with us again after four? Yes. Is that right? Okay, because we're going to, because we get into the really big awards. Yes, the nitty gritty. Hour, the really nitty gritty ones. Yeah. So we're talking like best picture, best actor, best, you know, all that Director, sort of stuff. Yes, yeah. indeed. Um, okay, we'll look forward to that. Let's catch up with, uh, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Van Connor and uh, Rebecca Perfect, who's with us this morning as well. Josh Rom sticking about with us. Uh, more from the Oscars as and when it happens throughout the morning on Talk Radio. Let's have a look at the weather as well first. Good morning, 20 past four Talk Radio. It's Monday morning and we are live in London with one eye on Los Angeles tonight. Van Connor is here with us this morning. Hello, Van. And uh, hello to you as well. Uh, Bex Connor is here. No, Bex Connor. <laughs> Bex, uh, I've been so hard. I've been trying so hard. Because you're, you're, you're Rebecca and Bex and I've been trying so hard to just get the right one. Yeah. And to stick with it. I've also ended up calling you Connor as well. <laughs> Ridiculous. You're <laughs> forgiven. It's 4.21 in the morning. Thank it's you. fine. I know, but this is, I've, no, this is my daytime. I've got yeah. no I do this True. every day. This is my Day. Um, Vex Perfect is here. Josh Rom as well, our arts and entertainment correspondent. We've had some big old awards in the last uh, 10, 20 minutes or so. Uh, Josh, fill us in. Where are we up to? So, uh, unpredictably, Joaquin Phoenix won for leading actor for his role in Joker. And I am so ecstatic and happy to reveal that Renee Zellweger has won the actress in a leading role category for her role as Judy Garland in the biopic Judy. I think that Josh is a Renee Zellweger fan. I don't know. No. Just gonna hazard a yes. No. You know what's really fascinating about this? Renee, Renee Zellweger now has two Oscars, which means she has two more than Judy Garland ever had. Right, wow, okay. <laughs> Which is weird. That is, that is a good stat. That's a very, very good fact. Weird. That's a great fact. Um, okay, let's start at the beginning. Uh, we've got um, uh, Joker, Joaquin Phoenix. No real surprises no. on on that front. And yeah. sort of all as is. Yeah, yeah and we've yeah. Heard, he heard, I've just been looking at the news, heard that he did a tour de force of a speech as well, so we'll have to kind of find out what the key nuggets of that is. Which is, apparently he became, it was a, a, um, a passionate speech about how he became a reformed character and uh, how humanity he needs to reform as well. This is the stuff that we, we had text at the start of the night saying, God, here we go, another another sort of work fest of, the, yeah. of these guys. And, and the, the, I don't know, are people getting a bit cynical about this kind of thing? I don't know, know. specifically with uh, Wiki, with Wiki Phoenix, there was, there's reason to be cynical, because his BAFTA speech was just, you know, rhetorical nonsense. It didn't really amount to anything. Thank you. And uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was just, oh, well, there's problems in the world, and you know what, these people need to fix it. Like, yeah, there's no practical solution there, buddy. And he's come up with this one, in which he actually has said something half-decent in this, mm. which 
which is to say, which is to take on council culture, effectively. And what he has said is, there are a million and one people in this room who have given me second chances. We can't keep, you know, perpetuate this idea of someone makes a mistake, you rule them out for good. Yeah. Well, you know. What a bunch of cynics that we've got in the studio today. I mean, you know, the BAFTA speech, I actually, I applauded him, as did a lot of people for his his addressing, quite frankly, about the, the diversity issue and that, saying that he is also, addressing the fact that he is also part of the problem. But in doing that, the thing was, if you cast your mind back to uh, uh, the, the three billboards, uh, which yep. were two years ago, yep. and if you remember uh, Frances McDormand's speech and the things she said, she came up with the, she, she dropped the notion of the inclusion rider in her speech. Yep. And the idea is you told everyone there and then this is the solution this is a thing you can do you know this is this is so you're saying you don't want waffle you just want I don't want waffle you want it solution it's it's yeah, but, it's, yeah, but it's not always it's not always on them to offer solutions is it sometimes you know you, they've got mm. a platform there and they and you you spot an injustice yeah it's on you it, it's it's you know if you if you spot an injustice you don't you aren't necessarily armed with the solution but because you aren't armed with the solution you choose not to use your platform to point out the injustice that that can't mm. be right either can it well i don't know to be honest i i, I, I keep i keep going back to because there, there was a discussion uh a few weeks ago. we had this discussion yeah. ourselves earlier about the Golden Globes and the Ricky Gervais speech. And the idea that when he went up there and he said, you know what, don't use this as a platform for some ridiculous, nonsensical, you know, political statement, anything like that. Most of you spent less time in school than Greta, uh, Greta Thunberg. Uh, get up here, thank your agent, thank your God, and, you know, do one. I'm not going to say what he actually said, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but that was the thing. I mean, even though, obviously, no one listened to him, and obviously important points were made, some, though, were exactly the speech that he warned them not to do. Yeah. And so many of these awards which is are exactly that. They're just they're grandstanding purely for the sake of grandstanding. But is it for the sake of grandstanding, or, or is it somebody who genuinely believes something using their platform to communicate? Uh, I I think it's the latter. I think that Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, you know, he's been, uh, well, he's been, we were talking earlier, he's been a vegan for, <laughs> for, for, since he was a kid. Now that, in this sense, it's just, we were talking, Josh and I were talking about the fact that he tried to change, was it the Golden Globes and also the BAFTAs to convert towards veganism. Mm, and, yeah. And, yeah. He's also yes, wearing, I know, he's that's he's quite he's also wearing the same, I mean, this is, this the is. The same suit across awards season. And it's yes. virtue signalling. Is and it that, virtue signalling? Well, that's, isn't that, isn't, it very, isn't it very de the definition of not virtue signalling? I.e. he's doing what he's committed to doing, yeah. what he's asking for the people today? Yes, but at people the same time it's coming across as virtue signalling because he's been so unfriendly to the press and Rebecca and I were talking about this on air, how I think that if he played the game more, his points would come across better. But the fact is he doesn't. He goes on a these, as Van said, these nonsensical tirades where it is pure grandstanding. Or he's just, you know, he's an actor, he's doing his job, he goes on set, he does a brilliant job there, he doesn't like the fodder and the waffle and everything that goes with it. Not every actor does yet you know issues that he does really care about if he has got a public platform he will pr he will promote that he doesn't doesn't want to promote other things i suppose or and to be fair and to back that point up yeah. as well we need to remember as well that you know joaquin phoenix has seen a very different side to hollywood his entire life yeah. so there is justification that you look at his brother who is you know arguably the tragic hollywood icon of the last 30 years and you know, remind us of his brother uh, River River phoenix. Phoenix. Yeah. and uh, you know you look at that i mean johnny depp is still is still on the scene and would you know would keep, uh, there's nothing to say river phoenix wouldn't be exactly the same as Johnny Depp today, or, or, or Winona Ryder, we're exactly the same sort of standing, the same sort of icon yeah. now. And he has grown up in that shadow. Yeah. And it's not really surprising that that might have given him a very specific attitude as regards these things. Uh, we are on the brink. It's not, it's not what you think it is. Uh, it isn't what you think it is. The screen, uh, okay. the, screen, the screen there is talking about something else. John, producer John, you can tell us the okay, winner. Okay, who does everybody think it is? I'm going to go, I'm going to go Parasite. Okay, Josh. Josh. I know who it is already. Okay, go yeah, on. Yeah, I've just seen who it is. Go on. Is, is it Parasite? <laughs> it is Parasite. Oh, oh, hell yes. We, yes. Saw this, we saw this coming through the, the course wow. of the evening. Yeah. Mm. And, four, and four awards. I think, four awards. Okay, let's just take some take stock of that. Going into tonight, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 were, the, the almost dead cert, or at least going into the last couple of weeks, the dead cert has been 1917 for a yeah. year. This is, this is a big, big upset. Yeah, put this into context for us. Start, I'd say, not upset. A lot of people are loving this because it picks up the palm door at Cannes. It's 
the brilliance about the brilliance about this film is that it's not got the showy aspect that maybe 1917 has of this one cut wonder. It's got so many complex layers and elements that all work seamlessly. So the storyline is incredible. The twists and turns are amazing. The cinematography is incredible. The production of it overall is just astounding to look at, and the acting is brilliant. It it takes a subtitled film, which for us from the for uh, we'll, we'll probably say normally we, we go to to the cinema to watch a subtitled film, not not as your first choice necessarily, mm. and yet it's seamless and it's effortless to watch this movie and I think it's, it's going to cross loads of I went to my local cinema yesterday to go and catch this sitting in there it was it was really full and people were excited about this movie it's a really positive thing I mean i would be honest I, I, having, I didn't see Parasite until this last week mm. uh, which, yeah. which seems to be the running trend doesn't it yeah. people, people going oh god it's really good we need to go and see it we jumped on the hype train yeah. Yeah, we yeah we did yeah. Yeah. and yeah. obviously producer Johnny and I uh, sat in the screening on I think it was Monday or Tuesday and watched it together and uh, we had a ball I think uh, Kermode had seen it four times at that point he was there as well um, I've now seen the film three times and right. wow. I, I, in, in that short space of time have you, have you seen week, it in black and white I have not seen it in black and white that is what I want <laughs> That's what you're missing. Um, I think, yeah. to be honest, that uh, Kang Ho's song uh, didn't get an acting nomination for this is interesting because I actually would have put him forward for that. I would have seen yeah, He played the father. He played it, the father, yeah. the best supporting actor. He would have been an interesting candidate. And the performance there, even more so than I think than anyone else in the film, is very nuanced, it's very laid, it's very measured, but it's just a great performance across the board. I'm a fan of his anyway because I, I, you know, I remember him being in, in Bong Joon Ho's Snowpiercer uh, uh, eight years ago now. I, just a terrific actor in a terrific movie. I it, it has no, sorry, I'll cut you off at the end there. Go on, go on. Do uh, you want to you end your point with a flourish? No, no, no flourish. Sorry. <laughs> no flourish. The film is great. Go and see it. It deserves Best Picture. It's made history, by the way, of being Best Foreign Language and, uh, sorry, Best International Feature, I'd call it that now. Yeah. And uh, Best Picture. That, that's history making in of itself. But right. uh, no flourish other than that. I was going to, I was going to add, just to add to that, this film has done what Roma failed to do. Mm -hmm. Roma last year won Best Internet, uh, won Best Foreign Language. It won Best Directing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it lost out to Green Book for the Best Picture Award. This parasite is groundbreaking not just by what you said, but the fact that it has done what Roma failed to do, and that was to win international, to win directing, and to win the best picture category. And do you know what, on that note, with the Roma comparison, it was interesting because Green Book kind of didn't win anything else, and didn't then suddenly it just picked up best picture. So it was... And I think Green Book was, I loved the film, but it was an upset, yes. whereas Parasite this year is an upstart. Nice, I like that. Very yeah. good. Agreed. Agreed. That. See, that's why you do this for a living. Mm. Very good. <laughs> um, it's actually not been nominated in any of the, any of the acting categories, has it? No. Uh, no. Parasite. No, so no. that's, I mean, is that in itself kind of unprecedented beyond... Yeah, beyond I think it is. I think, you know, if you, you're seeing a film that, again, is leading the charge from Cannes, mm. and you're thinking it's got a fantastic cast, everything about it is working, it's five stars across the board... Why are we not seeing the actors being nominated? Is there some form of diversity or prejudice there in some respects? Maybe. Who knows? Having said that, I mean, when I was growing up, I remember the late 90s when uh, Tom Hanks was up the best actor of Saving Private Ryan. I remember being very annoyed that Roberto Benigni won at uh, won over Tom Hanks because, as I have said for many years, and on the back of that, who knew so many members of the Academy spoke Italian? <laughs> but, yeah, having, so I accept that I, I, can, I can play both sides of that argument. Yeah. But, also, uh, also yeah. for this particular year as well, uh, both Parasite and 1917, the two favourites for Best Best Picture, neither of which were recognised for their acting talent this year. Mm. Neither yeah. of them. Mm. Yeah, a good performance from George Mackay as well in 1917. Again, uh, what? What? <laughs> I can't stand George Mackay. Do you think, can you not? I thought he was quite good in the film. I think he was, yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was Hard the, to carry a film like that. He, he, was, he was the best bit of it. He, in terms yeah. of acting, he was really good at it. He yeah. was really good at it. I, a lack of options. I mean, let's be honest, the two stars of 1917, as I keep saying, were basically Rodney, Rodney Trotter and a moist flannel. <laughs> Other than that, I'm sorry, but let's, let's be really, let's be really honest about 1917 and the state of its, for instance, script. 1917, as uh, the critic David Ehrlich has uh, has commented, is a, a, a sequence of great cinematography in search of a movie. Right. It, it really is. It mm. is arguably the cinematic equivalent of watching a friend play a Call of Duty game. Right. You know, just sitting there and That's watching. A very good point. It That's is. Right. It's like watching it's a, a nice Medal analogy. of Honor game being played in your living room, except blown up to a cinema screen and done in photorealism. Yeah. And, and funny enough, a lot of people who have seen that film, who have also seen Dunkirk, mm. actually kind of prefer Dunkirk. Mm. There's a lot. I felt there was more yeah. urgency with Dunkirk to uh, against 
the urgency of no, you're looking at me very very bizarre there's something like with the score with Dunkirk the ticking clock all that kind of stuff clever elements that made that something that again didn't didn't flourish at the awards I can I could hazard a guess as to that one you see Dunkirk had a gimmick that required you to think 1917 has a gimmick that requires you to sit there and watch it Two very different things. Mm, yes, right. very true. Well, well, and I was going to say, whilst uh, 1917 was just purely cinematic, and I think that's what the main thing that they wanted you to get out of. Uh, it, 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 Van, as you said, the main gimmick was for you to sit there and watch it and kind of be in awe of this fantastic picture that is one shot. It's emphasis on the journey. I don't think Dunkirk had a potential emphasis on a journey that much. It was just a case of a war's going on. Yippee. Do you know well, what? not what? so what? yippee, but what's going on? <laughs> 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 so you would, 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 not that. Uh, no, but Hot I, shots popped up. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Dun Dunkirk had the sense of urgency, but it didn't have the journey that mm. 1917 had. But you guys remember uh, when Dunkirk was released, everyone was like, oh, this uh, is Oscar, this is the front runner, this is going to walk I away with all the awards. With Dunkirk. Mm. Dunkirk had a literal journey. Across the English Channel, <laughs> an actual, literal A to B journey as one of its three stars. So but 1917 also had that journey. But also, where Dunkirk didn't have the journey, it also had the people, um, it, the, the people that uh, were staying on the beaches as well that were fighting on. For example, Kenneth Branagh's character at the end. I wonder. I wonder if I want just in, in defence of 1917. I, mm. I, I, I I was very very gripped by that film, yeah. um, in, in a way that perhaps uh, perhaps was driven slightly by the by the one shot element mm. by the cinema. P perhaps I'm sort of willing to be. There's your hype machine right there. The no. one shot element. That's yes. why everyone wanted to see and, it. And I'm, well, listen, the and I'm, and I'm, itself is interesting because it's two shots, not one, and it is yeah, it's 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 held up as this one shot. I think, like there's a very the bit distinct, where yeah. it goes dark. It cuts, yeah. it cuts to another time. Yeah, it's very, there's a, there's a actually, jump in a river. It's a fair point, that. Yeah, it's a fair point. Um, however, mm. I did find it very gripping, and I did find it, and I was, I, as much as I was um, gripped by it, it, it visually, I was also really willing that character on. And I was snapped out of it slightly, as I've said several times, as I've said already tonight, by the cameos. I mean, I thought, I thought that, the, I thought that the, the unnecessary throwing in of various uh, big names. Richard yeah. Madden, Colin Firth, yeah. Andrew Scott. Benny Cumberbatch. You know, I felt that that really pulled me out of the action, which was, which was frustrating. But but equally but uh, equally that you know the scene at the end that I, I don't think I'm going to give too much away it's on it's all line it's all through the trailers where he's running across um, that match the trenches, yeah. Yeah. and and they're going over the top mm. and it, and it's just absolutely which actually is interesting because they gave that away yeah. even though much of the journey is about him trying to stop them going over the top and yet you yeah. know from what we've been given already that they do which is quite interesting because I sort of knew that they were already mm. and yet I was completely with them completely there's, with there's them. a couple of points to to go on the back of that the first is it's interesting that uh, 1917, in its marketing, did not in any way indicate that visual gimmick. Didn't indicate no. that that was going to be a factor in it. It did look like a traditional war movie just mm. from the marketing because it's a big money shot. The the running, like you say, it was in the trailer. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, obviously, is the like you say that the, the withdrawal that comes with the the big celebrity cameos, effectively as they are. That really is a staple of uh, of the World War Two movie, of the World War One movie, of any war movie. Really, it's it's just a staple. I mean, you think, for instance, of something like Saving Private Ryan, and yeah. how that doesn't has like Ted Danson turn up, yeah. and, and Nathan Fillion wasn't really a celebrity at the time. Nathan Fillion, but you know, like now would be regarded. As one. Yeah. The way that it, it does that sort of a thing. Um, I don't know. With 1917, the, 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 I, it's all about those visuals. I love the uh, the, the fiery sequence. Yeah. You know, the, the, the in the nighttime in, 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 in the town. Of yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that is absolutely glorious, and it looks like Dante's Inferno. And in it's an absolutely beautiful sequence. Just, I just, just how much of a blow is it then that it's that it's lost for us? Do you know? Do you know what we we probably slap slap on the wrist for all of us critics here mm. um, today because. We should have seen this coming, in a way, because the BAFTAs almost is always that bridesmaid situation <laughs> with films. So it cleaned up at the BAFTAs, and we were like, Sam Mendes, you know, 1917, the big film. Sometimes, when we're really pushing that big British film, it doesn't pay off across the pond. Right. And sometimes, and you know, we didn't really see much. I, I don't think we saw much from Parasite, did we, for the BAFTAs? No, not really. No, no. not at all. So we're seeing a big, big twist and turn here. Yeah. And I think we should have seen that coming. We've seen sure. that in previous years happen with a number of different films where they picked up all the awards. It was a kind of like, well done, pat on the back, but you're mm. not going to get the big one. You're mm. not going to get the Oscar. Um, okay. Clearly, was the Critics' Choice.
Which one? Uh, the Critics' Choice when Bong Joon-ho was tied with Best Director for Sam Mendes. I think that was the sign that actually something could be coming. Yeah, when, critics, when critics are generally asked to give out awards, they're not really indicative of, of, of the Academy. I mean, the, the Academy is generally built out of actors and producers. Of course. Critics do not share those mm. mindsets. Mm. And 1917 um, was the fan favourite winning the Producers Guild Awards, the Directors Guild Awards, uh, the Golden Globes and the BAFTA. You know, this was going in as that firm mm. favourite mm. where the narrative was on its side. And that's um, why we love an upstart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's uh, let's uh, hear from another one of the big winners tonight. Renee Zellweger has won uh, Best Leading Role uh, for Judy up against uh, various people, which aren't on my, on my, on my paper in front of me right now. So I've got, I've got it if you want. Yeah, go on then. Cynthia Erivo for Harriet, Scarlett Johansson for Marriage Story, Saoirse Ronan for Little Women, and Charlize Theron for Bombshell. Okay. So Renee came out on top. Uh, much to Josh's delight, uh, who got to see her and meet her in the run-up to the Oscars. This is what happened. What did playing this character in this particular time period, what did that mean to you? Uh, it's hard to talk about it except as a really greedy, spoiled, rotten experience. <laughs> Honestly, I was, I was so curious. Um, I mean, the circumstances of her life in her final chapter just it didn't make sense to me when you consider that she'd been working at the highest levels for 44 years at the time of, um, you know, when the film is set, it, that she would face financial hardship and have difficulty uh, finding work. It just, it, I was very curious about what led to that and filling in the blanks, sort of, between The Star is Born and you now when she was at her zenith um, as a performer. Um, or at least considered a trussiness is more appropriate. Um, yeah, it, it was it was an exploration, and it was um, coming to understand um, her a bit better and what might have led to um, what she was grappling with toward the end of her life. And also, you know, um, I don't know, just to to look at it differently, because I know that there's more to a story than is written and I know that there's more to a life experience than people presume when they read whatever it is that someone has chosen to throw out as the narrative of a person's life mm -hmm. and um, I felt a lot of empathy for her and I felt that there was injustice in some of the things that had been written about her and her passing and um, it was very exciting to share this experience with a lot of people who really, really, really wanted to celebrate her and I don't know, I don't know in a way acknowledge her importance. Uh, Renee Zellweger, who has won Best Actress in a Leading Role at tonight's Oscars. This is the Oscars special 2020 on Talk Radio. Uh, Van, you just made a very interesting point about uh, about Renee Zellweger and, and, and particularly the role that she plays in Bridget Jones. Oh, is this the idea that it's it's now so weird? I was saying something I saw on Twitter earlier that it's now kind of hilarious, the idea that we the ridicule point of Bridget Jones is that she has a full-time job in PR <laughs> and her own apartment in London. How <laughs> pathetic must she be? I know. Yeah. She's absolutely living the dream. <laughs> The, the impossible yeah. dream these days. Uh, okay, listen, stand by. Uh, more still to come. We've got lots and lots of uh, other bits and nuggets and talking points to get into the next 20 minutes or so before Chris does here at 5 on Talk Radio. It is our Oscars 2020 special. Hang on there. Evenings with James Whale on Talk Radio. Why not join me, my friends? Listen to the wise words of the whale. James Whale. Well, I haven't got to be careful. I don't give a stuff one way or the other, to be honest with you. Evenings. With James Whale, weeknights from 7 on Talk Radio. 3, 2, 1, lift off! What have you done with my OCT eye scanner? I'm supposed to be doing an eye scan with Mrs. Green. Um, we launched it, like you said. Well, I, I meant launch it to the public, not on a rocket. Oh. Tell them how it takes a hospital-grade 3D image that could help detect eye conditions up to four years earlier. Oh, sugar. And that it's available at Specsavers. Oh, and now also in uh, outer space. <laughs> <laughs> Introducing our most advanced eye exam with OCT scans. Search Specsavers OCT to find out more. Charge applies. OCT available at selected stores. Why not stay in this Valentine's? Have a romantic night in with a bottle of Co-op Irresistible Prosecco for £8. 
co-op. It's what we do. Subject to availability, see participating stores for details. Please drink responsibly. One of these days, these boots are going to walk all over you. Sign up to Walk All Over Cancer with Cancer Research UK. Walk 10,000 steps every day in March to help raise money for life-saving research. And together, we will beat cancer. Are you ready, Boots? Start walking. Search Walk All Over Cancer and sign up right now. Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. Drive with Eamon Holmes on Talk Radio. Showbiz news, current affairs, big names, special guests. If it's happening, we're on it. Drive with Eamon Holmes. Monday to Thursday afternoons from 4 on Talk Radio. Overnight with Daryl Morris on Talk Radio. Uh, just gone 20 to 5 Talk Radio. Christo is here in about 20 minutes or so. It's Monday morning. I'm Daryl Morris. This is our Oscars 2020 special. Van Connor is here. Pleasure. Big old yawn there from you, <laughs> Long night, buddy. Long it's night. A long night, it has. Uh, we've got uh, um, uh, Vex Perfect here as well. Which Good morning. We, whose name I will get right without stumbling and yeah. stuttering or having to think about it. At least we've got Connor anymore. No, yeah, exactly. We're We're making progress, anyway. Yeah, We're making good. progress. <laughs> um, our artist entertainment correspondent, Josh Rom, is, what, is here as well. Van, you said it's a long night. I was just saying outside to other colleagues, this has gone so quickly for me tonight. Do you think so, yeah? It's gone. It's been a breeze. An absolute breeze. Which is surprising, given that it's actually been a very predictable Oscars. Mm, you know, yeah. sometimes you're thinking... Bar, oh, that, bar that one big, which I think, because we were all sort of leading up to it, weren't we? The yeah. big Best Picture that's gone yeah. to Parasite. If you're just waking up this morning, Parasite, the shock winner of Best Picture. Shock-ish. I think we sort of <laughs> watched the trend go that way. Um, the, other, the other thing I want to pick up on, um, uh, briefly, we've got about 15 minutes or so, so um, as many things as we can in the next sort of 15 minutes. Should I go is, to the tally? Yeah, go through the tally, yeah. You go through the tally, then I'm going to make a point that's relevant to that. Okay, exactly. Yeah. I, I thought, we we're on the same way. Yeah, right, right. right. yeah. yeah. So, it. Parasite has led the wins with four wins, uh, followed closely behind with 1917 with three wins. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Joker and Ford versus Ferrari after 1917 with two wins. And then Marriage Story, Jojo Rabbit, Rocket Man, Judy, Bombshell, Little Women, Toy Story 4, Neighbours Window, Hair Love, American Factory, and Learning to Skateboard in a War Zone if you're a girl with one win each. Um, okay. How big a deal is it that the Irishman is not on that list? It's Ooh. interesting for the amount yeah. of money that went into it I mean, and the amount of clout that it had. Scorsese, incredible cast. Huge amount of money, huge amount of publicity, and it's come away with nothing. Is that going to yeah. be? And Netflix going to be? Is that? Is their party going to be a bit? A bit, uh, bit soured. A bit soured tonight. I, I, th I think. I think so. I mean, I hope they invited Michael Bay and the Six Underground guys along. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just to live it all. I think. And ben Hardy from EastEnders. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think the big thing for Netflix has got 20 nominations across the board, so it's 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 a step up from where they were last year, and I think. For them, it can only get better. It, it probably was a gamble that didn't pay off with the Irishman. You think you put all these big names together, it, it's a shoe in right? It's a, the, this has got to win. It's got a winning formula. But sometimes that just doesn't pay off. And actually, I'm not going to say that anything's been a runaway winner tonight. It's quite, you know, it's quite flat across the board in terms of what has actually picked up the awards. There's nothing, despite the nominations and Joker leading the pack with 11, we're not. We've seen it pick up two. Mm. It's it, it's not that exciting in that respect. You're not. The parasite stuff is great because that answers all the que well, not all the questions, but it answers a lot of questions of you know the diversity issues mm. in some respects. It's great to see something like that pick up the best, the top prize, and it's great to kind of see it go against something like the Irishman, you know, mm. and actually triumph. Mm. It's a positive thing, I think. Is it, is it bad news for, for, for Scorsese? Where does that sort of sit in his... He's Scorsese. Kind of, How can it be bad news? Because so, so <laughs> actually, fine. Would, you, would you ordinarily, if, if, if a director came along and they had this huge budget and this other, and okay, it's got a good chunk of nominations, but came away with nothing, would that be a bit of a scar on their career? Slowly? I'll be really honest. The sadist in me is really sad that Avengers Endgame didn't win that visual effects Oscar. Me too. Just so that we could genuinely say, hey, Marty, the Marvel 
horror movie won an Oscar. <laughs> What's your excuse? <laughs> oh. Of course, because uh, in reference to his criticism of, uh, mm. of the Marvel movies. Yeah. I, I do have a very interesting point here because I've got a spreadsheet and I've been tracking <laughs> all, all the narratives through, throughout award season and th and I've been tracking it from the Oscars, the Golden Globes, the Screen Actors Guild Awards, the BAFTAs and the Critics' Choice Awards. Interestingly, even though it didn't come up on top at the Oscars tonight, 1917 still wins out of those five ceremonies with 15 wins, followed closely behind with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with 11, and then Joker in 10, and then Parasite also with 10. In fact, you know, we Van and I were saying off screen, someone that might be quite bitter about not getting the Best Director Award is probably Tarantino. Yeah, in terms of expecting mm. Mm. it to be his time. Because he's Tarantino. Because he's has Tarantino. He won it? Has he won it? Uh, I don't think he's ever won it, has he? No. And I think... Did he not? Did he win for Django? Uh, producer John will be here with some... No, he's won two screenplay Oscars. Mm. Uh, was one of them Django? I thought oh, one was Django and Jane, one was Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Oh, right, but he's okay. not win... Uh, but he's actually he's also said that his next film will be his last. His tenth film will be his last film. Yeah. He, well, he keeps promising. Yeah. He's done that before, has he? <laughs> it's like Soderbergh. Soderbergh always promises he's, he's, ending. he's always said his tenth film will be his last. This was his ninth film. So, you know, it, we, we, we need to wait and see whether he'll go beyond the number ten. But he has always said the number ten. He just hasn't reached that number as of yet. Does that he also said he'd make a Star Trek movie. Oh, maybe his tenth will be a Star Trek movie. Yeah, no, it no, it's going to be. I reckon, it, I reckon he'll get Uma Thurman back and it's going to be another Kill Bill. Do you think uh, do you think that kind of makes him a bit of a shoe in for 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 some awards? Uh, do, do, do the Academy sort of like bands the next time, awards? yeah, because <laughs> oh. it's his last, and you know. Well, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, Tarantino is like a celebrity director, right? So do, you know, I'm not taking anything away from him. That's but, absolutely true. That's yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. Like, is it? Are we seeing it because it's a it's a Tarantino movie, and we're expecting? to see something bonkers and a little bit out there and different because it's him and we go and see it we pay that money Greatness. because of his name mm. but but actually in the grand scheme of things of what he's doing versus all the other directors is he achieving the same levels i'm not so sure well, if we look at tarantino i mean objectively for one thing like you say celebrity director yeah. tarantino is arguably the most physically recognizable director in yeah. the world he is the only director i think that you could physically show an image of to people and they would instantly know who that is sure. second to that would probably be spielberg for instance yeah. uh, maybe maybe Scott says he. i would say maybe maybe James James man on the street i don't think we're going to I say James Cameron, but I would say Scorsese. I no, don't. I no, disagree. I don't. Spielberg, I disagree. Spielberg, yes. Scorsese, yes. James Cameron, no. James you showed Cameron your grandmother maybe. a picture of Martin Scorsese. You think she'd know who he was? Christopher, Nol Christopher Nolan. Listen, I, 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 I'm, I'm in showbiz. <laughs> my family loves showbiz. My, my, oh, my sorry, grandmother's sorry. Let, weird. Let's rephrase that. If you showed Sorry. someone else's grandmother yeah. <laughs> an image of Martin, you think they'd recognise him? I think he's got a distinctive smile, doesn't he? I think one thing about showing it to my grandma, I think she would. I think she'd go John. Uh, I sat next to James Cameron once in a bar and I didn't recognise him. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That tells you everything you need to know. Um, uh, listen, a, a lovely line from Olivia Coleman, by the way, uh, who, who uh, presented an award tonight saying, uh, last year's ceremony, she won uh, Best Actress, of course, Leading Actress. Last year's ceremony was the best night of my husband's life. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the favourite isn't the favourite. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but again, it's one of those one the big front runner for all the nominations and actually only picked up the uh, one award. The one award, actress, award. Yeah, yeah. So true. we're seeing similar things to Joker. Here. Very true. Um, how and I know that we haven't been necessarily watching it. Maybe John, you can kind of give some insight onto this because you've kind of had a slightly closer eye on it in terms of the the sort of logistics of it. Not having a host this year again is that is that is that the new format now for the Oscars? Do you think? Has I think so. I, I think it actually works because what they do is they get a lot. Of, they uh, have different people in different areas of the theatre. So some people will be on the stage, some will be in the, the audience, some will be by the orchestra pit. And uh, and, and every ward or every, every section is slightly different. And so you'll get the, uh, somebody will come up and they'll just, they'll introduce them, they'll, they'll talk about something and then they'll introduce the person coming on to, to present the award. And, uh, and other people come on and talk about, you know, the, the different aspects that they talk about. And, uh, you know, the, uh, and, and I, I actually quite like that idea because it's it's not all just focused on one person and one person's personality and their desperation sometimes to try and make the audience laugh mm. and what what it allowed it to happen actually was that the the people presenting the awards were allowed to be funny because 
it wasn't just all pinned on the host to be funny. Yeah. And so you you had you know people like Kristen Vig turn up do do a very very funny speech. Um, you know it, it's it, and pe- the, the presented the people who presented the awards and they presented them quite often in in pairs. They they had a chance to play with each other and do really silly silly things. Mm. You know Will Ferrell did a, did a really funny little little comic turn. And and so I I actually quite like this format. So it, it's not just so centric on one person. Yeah. And because I mean look at the back of the Golden Globes, the majority of the conversation was about Ricky Gervais, wasn't it? It was about Ricky Gervais. His, uh, his, his monologue and his, his scathing attack on them. Um, Cat's also got a bit of a kick in, didn't it, as well, during the uh, thing? That's sort of it's got a, a bit of a kick in throughout awards season. Of award season. Award first, season. It was, first, it was, I, I said this off air, first it was Rebel Wilson raising the bar high at the BAFTAs, and then James Corden went, all right, now I've got to step it up. So he dressed up as, up. A, as, as, as a Cat's character. In the that he's in. Yeah, I was going to put out there as well that uh, because obviously 1917 wasn't quite the awards clean sweep, it's a good job it made money. It wasn't the awards clean sweep, it was because. That the existence of that film, I'm pretty sure, is the only thing keeping an executive at Universal who previously greenlit Cats and then succeeded it with Doolittle in the job. Really? It's got to be. Got to be. <laughs> that being in the middle has to be the only thing that prevented that man from leaping out a window. Like Robo it was Pop-Star. Universal saving grace, absolutely. Mm. Um, some performances as well. So Billy Eilish performed I, again. I know we've sort of been in the studio, so we haven't seen them uh, yeah. blow by blow. But uh, we were, w- there was some speculation. Mainly from Josh, uh, that, he, that she might do the bomb, the bomb theme. And the entertainment um, industry as well. And the entertainment industry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's an interesting way to say it. <laughs> well, d- well, yeah, it would. And, and look, you, you, you're, I mean, exactly what I said, Van. Uh, is, but, Billy, is Billy Eilish going? Uh, I was uh, just going to say, but is Bond as big a thing to, to launch at the no. Oscars? No, I don't think it is. It's, so. it's, I mean, it's, it's, she would be launching potentially an iconic movie theme song at a night dedicated to uh, favorite, favoring movies. Remember, so, we're Brits. That, we really favor bonds. Yeah. That's exactly the point. I had this conversation with an American... But it's not nominated for anything, is it? Oh, no. it's not, it's, 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 it's not, it's not been released it? yet. That's a good point, yes. Good point. I had Sorry. this conversation <laughs> with an American friend recently. Americans do not give a toss about Bond. I'm they sorry, not. they don't. Do you think it's more also the Asian markets and the international markets, not yeah. so much Americans? Very because, much so. Because I know it does do well here, but it is known to be a blockbuster franchise that does make money abroad as well. Mm. And especially because the Americans loved Daniel Craig in Knives Out. Well, they if you loved lo- him. If you look at, for instance, at particularly since the 90s, uh, the supporting cast of Bond movies uh, and the international range of them, and but specifically how international they are, actually surprisingly few Americans turn up in Bond movies. And when they do, they're, not given, they're mm. not given great sense. We tend to forget now that it was only two movies ago that David Harbour was in a Bond movie. Mm. And look at David Harbour now. At, and if we look at the cast of the upcoming movie, we've got Lashana Lynch, mm. Brit, Naomi Harris, Brit, yeah. Ray Fiennes, Brit, uh, Ben Whishaw, Brit, you're absolutely Anna, right. Anna Diarmas, goddess. <laughs> She's amazing. Final, final, She's final, amazing. Final point of the night, the Brits have lost out on uh, 1917 winning uh, Best uh, Picture, but uh, Taron Edgerton mm-hmm. has technically won for Best Original Song yes. because uh, the, the song from Rocket Man that he performed... Won the, won the Oscar. So yeah, but you go. didn't write it. Is that? And the award goes to whoever wrote oh, it. Oh, sure. and it went to. And it went, in this instance, it went to Elton John and Bernie Taupin. Oh, so. always there, always there to pop the balloon. Um, listen, guys, it's been a real Sorry. pleasure. Thank you very much for being thank with us you. on this uh, this Oscars special. Van Conner, thank you. Anna, thank you for having me, Daryl. That's perfect, thank you. Thank you very much. Nailed it. Uh, <laughs> Josh Ron, thanks a lot. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, more on that throughout the day on Talk Radio, and uh, we'll catch up with Chris Doe. He's here from five next.